So, hi everybody. Welcome to Traditional Japanese Clothing. Ooh. Basically, um, what I plan on talking about is um, OB parts, uh, types of kimono and types of OB, and uh, some of the different knots that you use. Does anybody have any experience with Japanese clothing whatsoever? None? None? Okay, no cool. We're going to um, cover the basics. This yeah. is the basics panel. You know, 101 is what it sometimes the offer would tend to be called. But to, uh, eventually we'll get into other things. But for now, da -da, we are the Brass Apple. I'm Stephanie, that's Brian. Right. Um, we kind of have our own sort of business thing where we like to sell jewelry and accessories to add some ethnic flair into your wardrobe. Uh, we don't sell kimono, I just like to talk about it. Um, if you want some kind of Americanized kimono, talent that uh, designs by Talon is in the dealer room and they're really awesome. Kimono starts at like, I think, hundred bucks. Anyway, Did so. Real quick rundown on how we got to know this. We had a wedding. We decided to have a Japanese wedding. <coughs> when you decide to have a wedding that doesn't involve traditional clothing of your own of any kind, yeah. Um, you end up learning a lot, um, and we did. Uh, there's a lot of resources out there. Um, the trick is find, trying to figure out what's good, accurate resource versus what's just some schmo saying something. You're saying, you know. Um, and the only way I'd say we're a little more than just that schmo is that we we bothered at least going to those good resources first. Um. <laughs> Pretty much everything I learned, I learned from Immortal Geisha forums. So if you put in www.immortalgeisha.com, there's a IG forums thing, and they're totally cool. So, kimono parts. There's a lot involved. Or there can be, depending on the formality of everything. This is a very formal uh, setup here. Um, okay, so my bullet points. How to do bond. It's, it's like a slip. Basically, its main purpose is to keep sweat from staining your silk kimono. Why they make silk juban, I don't really understand. It feels good. Personally, it breathes. This is actually a naga juban, which is a full length of one. But mine is made out of synthetic. I can ha I can machine wash this, which makes it really handy. All right, so while I'm on the subject, underwear, ladies, wear sports bras, especially like thinner, the straps the better. The kind of, the faux pas that you can have end up here is this W-wing of your boobs. That tends especially happen with underwire bras. Same kind of, you might be tempted to wear a thong or some like really skimpy underwear under it. Don't do that. Another thing is besides the shape, you get the, the jiggle, and in Japanese clothing, that is not your goal. In fact, she probably has like a bunch of towels or rags padding to make sure that you don't see her chest line. So the the overall idea is that you're hiding the curves of the body. Yeah. Uh, you're making a cylinder out of that one glass. Of sorts. Um, so all the different areas where you're going to stick out one way or another, you're kind of helping pull those in different ways. Um, so that's that's the key aspect that you'll see in the multiple layers that are going to occur. Okay. So Han Eddie is if you see under the kimono up around her neck, it's like a decorative uh, piece and. Sometimes it's part of the juvon, but a lot of times it's just a collar by itself. And other than being, that's, that's a juvon that he's wearing. This, he's this showing is, off the hunt area is like the stitched in, in this case, part. Not always. Not always. They do have some that are just kind of a slip-on kind of thing to cover that. Uh, so, yeah. it basically its purpose is to help form and shape the neckline. Um, which, depending on how stiff your kimono are, they can really kind of, they can bake in, um, or yeah. whatever <laughs> the term. Yeah. Um, the erishin, or also known as the easy collar, is usually this plastic piece of, of basically you would stick it in 
the Hana Ebi to kind of, it's, it's a form. It, once again, it's, it's like the little plastic stays on dress shirts. Yes. For the, like the collar line, it, it's just a big thick one to actually go in a kimono. Yeah. I think, and it keeps it up in that form. Keeps this nice little curve that you see up around her neckline, kind of there and in place. Um, um, real quick, specifically as far as neckline goes, for regular everyday wear like this, you're not allowed any more than three finger widths from the nape of your neck. Otherwise, it's the neck and the back of the neck. For a lot of Asian people, tends to be very erotic. So unless you are like geisha or theater or dancer or something like that, obviously if you're cosplaying those people, then I guess you can explain that away too. But generally, don't do it. Um, koshihimo. Ah, koshihimo. Koshihimo. These are the most useful things ever. This is what holds everything together. Since there are no buttons, there are no ties, this is your tie. You tie everything, you probably need about five of these for this look. For, for women, yeah. Now there's going to be a couple, you may, what, however many you plan on actually having incorporated in it, because they'll hide, you're probably going to want a couple extras, because depending on the knots and how it's being done, sometimes you need just temporary ties. Um, like the Juban will have one to two, depending on how you're trying to hold things in. Um, and then kimono will have the kimono will have a couple, and you might have another one to kind of help you tie, uh, keep the uh, obi together as you're trying to get the knot done and get the other accessories for it done. And once everything's gold, then you pull it out. Sometimes. Sometimes. Otherwise, so, you just tuck it on yeah. top of the obi. And for men, there's like two max. You probably won't have to use more than that. Um, most actually, the teal ones, those are all homemade. You just got little cotton strips. Korean belt. Ah, uh, yeah, that, that thing. It, it's basically, it clips to one side and it's basically kind of elastic y. It goes around and clips to this other side. What its purpose is, is to help keep the kimono closed. Once again, helping with the whole neckline thing. That's a big issue in Japanese clothing. You know those little elastic cover clips that they have for beds to keep your bed sheets on? And it's like that. But make it goes around you though. Um, and we made ours out of um, the weird little clippy. There's a little hole section and everything in like kimonos that allows for those to go through. And women use it mostly and their ovaries generally tend to go over it. Date jime. Date jime are once, uh, also under the obi. And basically, their purpose is to flatten all the koshihimo and everything so that you have a, a nice foundation for when you are putting on your obi. This is pretty much only women. Uh, I made mine out of pleaters tape and Velcro. Yeah, I mean, they, they have some that are a little fancy that might have little hooks or whatever, but a lot of the modern ones nowadays just make use of Velcro. So essentially all it needs to do is go around you and pull. Yeah, um, kind of in, um, Retrospect, I probably might have used something more elastic y because actually I was much, I was about, I don't know, 20 pounds lighter, so like most of those don't. Or you can work more. in some elastic if you really, really want. That's true. Um, but it's the way we designed it to begin with, there's a larger portion here, so depending on how tight or loose you need, she's got a little variance. Um, now, if you, um, if you're a little larger and you have a little more you want to kind of help pull inwards, you can make wider versions of just find like, I would suggest a, just a nice durable uh, canvas type thing or something like that. Um, you want a good stiff weight behind it and just however wide you need it. Um, that way you don't have an awkward pull in one area and the rest of it doesn't or something like that. Yeah, uh, then you know, there's also just having kind of a light cotton wide thing that you could tie like maybe under the kimono. Yeah. It's what part, there's actually a type of obi called a hara obi. Um, that's basically used for pregnant women to help support, but also originally to hide their pregnant, uh, their you know five months and more pregnant belly because uh, the empress, I believe, that started the trend 
was also a battle person, so you know, you're fighting, you don't want your big belly coming kind of in the way as you're trying to kill people. So it just gives you a nice kind of more flattening area to yeah. kind of again the cylinder is what you're looking for. Um, something we didn't mention the the little that's that's the next section. Oh, that's the next one. Okay. Okay, so kimono is obviously this outerwear. I'll get into more specific types <coughs> of kimono here in a few minutes. Kimono are generally one size fits most. Yeah. Most. Um, so you will have to to look around if you do need different sizings. Um, height wise as well. Nowadays, just get it as close as you can if you're tall, because or get it made for you. Um, the likelihood that you're going to find one near your height is unlikely because they're still made a little more towards Japanese proportions. Okay, okay. on on the measurement thing. Basically, the measurements that you need are from your uh, each wrist, wrist to wrist, uh, nape to feet, shoulder to shoulder. Shoulder to shoulder, and then I think maybe a little bit hip. Uh, yeah, well, you can use the shoulder to shoulder for the most part. And yes. um, at the larger you are, or the more broad shouldered you are, the shoulder to shoulder one's going to be a real big difference. It's what's going to help determine how much room you have for the lapping over, whether it overlaps here or properly here, kind of thing. Um, the wider, the better, then for that. Excellent. Moving on, Obi. This is based on women's OB. It's really complicated. Well, it's not that complicated, but we'll talk about that tomorrow when you guys show up to my OB tying workshop. Yeah. So, OB. I am wearing an OB. It is pretty. This portion here is the OB. It's basically a big, wide belt sash thing. It's a gigantic piece of fabric. Oh, OB. Okay. Yes, OB. Show them OB. Any OB. That is the most formal type of OB. Let me show you how ridiculously long it is. Because it's fun. So this much fabric goes around your waist. Goes around your waist. It makes for really fun, gigantic um, OB knots. This is double layered. Not much. It gets heavy. I managed to get this thing for like $85 with complete steel. Um, there's, you own the different types later, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Obiage. It's a scarf looking thing. Actually, I've used a scarf before. Um, I often use those, which we also made because we were on a budget. And its purpose is to hide what I'm going to cover here in a minute, the Obimakura, which is this big pillow thing. I might as well cover it now. Which and we also made. That's what makes the kind of, that's what helps make things three dimensional, especially in a uh, formal uh, obi knot tying. And you use the obiage to help cover that because they're not always so pretty. And then you will tie it in this front portion. And the younger you are, the more you can get away with the amount that you show. Clearly this is a young woman because as you get older, you push it more and more down to where it's barely even sticking out when you're like an old, decrepit lady. Um, so, Obijime, it's this rope thing. It's mostly for decoration. Sometimes it can help uh, in holding up your obi in its certain uh, knot style, but for the most part, it's pretty. We use upholstery cord because once again, it's much more easily accessible. And the thing I don't like about it is it doesn't lie as flat as actual ones, because these are a bit more like... Um, Depends on how they're made. There are some rounded ones, but um, there's also... They're more like... A flat um, kind of braided boot, one. Boot strings, like to tie up your boots. And more flat, mm -hmm. kind of shoestring type thing. It's and done up in a particular weave that gives a nice flat kind of shaping to it. But there's, okay. there's different types. So, Hobi Makara. A quick, easy obi makura, get an old sock, put some stuffing into it, and some pantyhose. And then, there you go. That's what we use. That's the unofficial one. It's so easy and so much cheaper than getting things from Japan. And it gets covered. So and it gets covered, nobody so sees nobody it. sees it. The younger you are, the more fluffy you should make it. And as you get gradually older, there should be less filling, because it should be less obvious. Okay, so obi which is that thing that you wanted to 
talk about before. Okay. I don't actually end up using one because maybe I'm lazy. But it's basically it's a big plastic thing about like this. We put it in the front in between the layers of your OB and it basically it makes sure that this stays flat whenever you're sitting or standing so that you don't get this weird crunching that happens. They're very into things being very good. It's mainly because of the, again, you're trying to fill the gaps. And so it's just that nice firm layer for it to kind of sit on top of and, and keep it from doing the crinkle bunch up here and there, especially depending on how stiff or not stiff your OB is. Um, this one, while it's thick, it's fairly loose. This one is very stiff. It's actually kind of a pain in the butt. But I like it. Uh, Domain. I don't actually have an example of an Obidome. It's, I call it the bling bling. It's as close to jewelry as you get in kimono wear. No, actually either. No. <coughs> um, basically, I use brooches. Like, you know, your grandma's old, super, not quite rhinestone sh turtles and things. I it basically, it slips onto the uh, OBG man. OBG man, um, gives you a little decoration. Like I tend to put it here um, in the front to make it obvious. It, it's just a little, you can have a couple, they're pretty, they're really, I mean, sometimes they're cheap, sometimes they're, oh my God, expensive. But then you look at the craft work and you go, oh, no wonder. Let's see it. Okay, so, Tabby. Most Everybody. people know what Tabby socks are. They're the, the split toe socks. There's two different types. You've got your, your generally formal ones, um, no stretch at all. They're made to fit pretty close to whatever your size foot is. Um, and they have like these little hooks or, or little tabs basically, little metal tabs that kind of just slip into a couple of stitched areas um, to hold it. And it has a little bit of a, a minor uh, bottom sole kind of separate on it. it it's like house sock almost. Um, and then you have the stretchy kind that are like socks. Yeah. Um, pull they're on, little, and they're less formal for those. Technically. Yeah. But uh, you don't have to worry about them if you're wearing yukata, which we'll get to into what yukata is in a minute. So geta or zori. Geta. These are the modern version of geta. Basically, it looks in. Uh, zori are a um, like a grass weave type of sandal. Or sometimes now modern ones are just kind of a nice flat sandal. Yeah. Um, Really Whenever you see off. things like Memoirs of the Geisha, I think she had like the gigantic one-toothed Geta, the traditional kind. They have some really, really fancy ones. I mean, there's like, yeah, the big one-tooth. There's one kind of, it, it's technically a one-tooth, but it comes in like a wedge. There's um, a bunch of different They've got a couple other, yeah. Um, technically, this would be considered a two-toothed Geta. One, two, you can see the separation. Um, but they have some where it, it literally, looks almost like a regular shoe, so you're like, wait, huh? Um, this is a good definer. It's essentially the thong. I forget what the actual term is for it, but they're very decorative. When you buy these from anybody who actually produces them, you can select which one of the, like what pattern and colors and stuff like that you want for them, and they'll put it in, because they have to insert it before they actually drop the sole on. Okay, okay so can check the oral awesome. Kinchaku, I have one of those. It's the cute little bag that you, the, the wasu are more like kind of cylindrical. They're more like this shape and have a little handle. They usually come with matching uh, little sandals or shoes. Um, they're really cute. You find them on eBay all the time. Um, Netski. You can make do with dice bags. Dice bags do work. They're awesome for that. Netski. Netski. Ooh, here's a cute little one. All right. Cool. So, these little guys keep your Kentaku or other bags and items and such attached to you. Um, it's a nice decorative piece. They'll be done out of wood, stone, um, all sorts of intricate carvings, designs. They run anywhere from $15 to, uh, I think the most expensive I've seen so far was $450. Um, but it was also some really, really pretty stonework carving. Um, they're all generally about this size. Um, this one's a little pace, I don't know how detailed you see, but since there's not a lot of you, I can come out to you. Yeah, they're all way back there. So the way this works, is you just pick it up, 
under on the bottom, come up through, and it just lays over like that and keeps from pulling through. You know, it's got to be pulled through pretty hard, or you're going to notice if it does, kind of thing by that time. Um, and keeps it attached to you. How is one of the different types of jackets used mostly by men, but some women? Um, it kind of looks like a half kimono. Oh, there it is. It's there. So this one's a men's. It goes up over your kimono. It's for those super, super formal times, like, I don't know, graduation, much, funerals, Much like wedding. kimono, um, especially on the men's, they do tend to be lined. Uh, and this is where you get the nice fanciness. So this lining will drive up the cost mm -hmm. on a kimono or a halari, um, depending on what it is, how old it is, what the seam is, etc. Um, basically, slips on, there you go. And it's held with an actual howdy tie, um, which can be sometimes two little uh, springs. The formal ones have the big like pom-pom puff -pom balls on them. So if you, you see, see like wedding pictures or sometimes you'll see like those big, huge white pom-pom things. Um, I've actually just got a nice little beaded thing that I made up. And there's there are little hook loops in here already designed in so that you can attach your little ties. But it's held fairly open, um, you know, you don't want to actually come bound up like it. And it would just drape like so. So just a nice little addition. Okay, okay. Kanzashi, which I did not actually bring with me. Nope. They're basically, uh, mostly, most of the Japanese hair ornaments can fall under the term Kanzashi, but the word Kanzashi is based off of the Japanese word for to fold. And basically they take square, like one inch squares of silk, fold it up into petals, and then make either, mostly flowers and butterflies, but some of the masters will actually make like big dragon headdresses and they're totally awesome, so you should look it up. Okay. Types of kimono. Am I boring you yet? No, okay. good. I always worry when people are really quiet and they're staring at me. <laughs> so, Fudasole. This is what you wear when you are young, unmarried lady. This is your fancy dress. Yes, this is the fancy dress. You only wear it to really formal occasions when you are like strutting around like a peacock. Look at me, Look at me I'm so beautiful. Coming out party. Yeah, like uh, usually, what age? 16? We're, we're going to get our goddaughter one of these for her prom. So, yeah. No. 16? <laughs> Somewhere around that age, yeah. Basically, this is, you get to start wearing this whenever you become a lady. It could be 14 and up, depends on you know time frame. Yeah. yeah. And so basically what makes this distinct is it's really bright colors and mostly the long flowing sleeves. Uh, the older you get, the shorter the sleeves should be. Um, tomosore and Ido Tomosore. They're virtually the same. Uh, Ido means color, so you get black with a design, or color with a design. Usually with crests, there's actually five crests. There's two in the front and then three in the back. And then basically what identifies uh, tomosore from other kimono is just this, it's only the bottom that is designed. And of course, when you have it on, you'll only see this half or this half. You yeah, you see, see part of it, yeah. The whole thing. This is what you wear when you are the mother of the bride, mother of the bride, close friend at weddings, graduations, other super formal events. You're not showing up the main person who's wearing the food, so I did. Yes. <laughs> go This is what you wear to funerals. Obviously not your own funeral, because you'll be generally, most of the time, uh, depending on your religion, you'll be dressed in a white. That is the f funeral color for the burial person. Depends on if it's a Buddhist or Shinto based. Yeah. So while I'm talking about that, real quick, when you put on kimono, left over right, the right over left is reserved 
for people being buried. So don't make that mistake. Dead people, spirits, etc. Which is why sometimes you will see if they bothered to put in the little detail, and uh, sometimes they do. Some of the Japanese horror movies, the like dead spirit, you know, ghost ghosts, things, etc. You'll actually see their kimono wrapped the other way. Something subtle for you to notice in your Japanese horror films. So, what makes Mofuku different than any other kimono or Ovi or anything else? It's all black. It might have a design on it, but that design is also in black. Black embroidery on black. Black, black, black. Sadness. So, basically, uh, when someone really close to you dies, you wear all black. Even your OB is black with and black OB design. Is OB. <laughs> it's all black. It's like this. Super black. I emphasized black enough. So, as you are gradually coming out of mourning in the next year, uh, you start adding color. So, you might start, oh, I'm going to wear Tomosore now. I'm wearing black. It's a design. Alright, cool. And then, you'll start wearing colored obiage. Okay. When it comes to the end, the obi is the last thing to have color in it again. So it might be a black background with a little bit of color and then eventually just you're back to normal. You're back to normal. But the obi is the last thing. The obi is the big thing. Also kind of important, um, depending on how you're, how close you are to the person who died, like... Um, the period of mourning. Yeah. Changes. Well, you don't start at the whole black. Yeah. Like, oh, you died. Your mother will be in all black. My uh, husband, a spouse will be in all black. But, you know, um, her, her best my friend. distant cousin, yeah. <laughs> who is technically related to me, but not particularly close, will not probably in all, be in all black. Or when my really, clo like, really close friends might not be, because it say I died, he might get the impression, say if it was a male, that I was also having a close relationship with that person too, and then there's ugliness. So, yeah. so anyway, I included this picture. This is what uh, a lovely lady in the Immortal Geisha forums has done to basically make Mofuku more wearable in modern times, since the full-on black kimono thing isn't really used so much. Unless you're doing a whole Japanese doll thing. Yeah. Doesn't happen much though. Yeah. So basically, like, they wanted to try to find a way to wear this beautiful obi that they purchased, but they don't want to, they don't want to offend somebody by just having it as is, so they decided to add a little color and try to make it more. Hiroji. Uh, yes, either they are all solid color, or once again, they are solid color, that same color as the design. Yeah, you can kind of see in that green there, there's a little bit of a design work to it. It's like a Mofuku, except it's color. I think it's kind of leaf. And this is for, like, tea ceremony, and... <coughs> formal, but not, like, uber formal. Yeah. 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 Only in Sukesage. Yes, I said it right this time. <laughs> awesome. So what makes this more unique is that it does have a little at the a design at the bottom, but it also has sleep, which I have one. This is what I wore to my wedding. It's got you can't see them very well, but it's got butterflies in different colors, white and purple, in varying shades. Really pretty. Um, basically, more or less, these are the same. It just depends on the quality of the material. The Palongi is the really, really nice material that richer people got to wear. This is more, um, I had the end of a bolt, hey, you know, that probably falls more into the Tsukasagi. They're, they're actually, like, they, in this case we have two different ones, but literally they could be the same fabric. 
Yeah. Um, but one was, like you said, the end of the bowl, which is tend to be a little rougher, sometimes imperfection. Out of season. Out of season, kind of portion, whatever. And so that'll be the difference. I think there's actually a little bit of construction um, difference minor. too. Like a minor. Yeah. Like, oh, this stitch is slight. Again, end of the bulk changes. Yeah. yeah. Casual kimono, cologne, and samugi. Once again, kind of a, depends on how nice the fabric is and how rich you are. This is more going to be the pieces left over from the bolt. Um, basically, what makes these different than the other kimono is it's the same pattern continuing. This is pretty much our entire kimono collection, so please don't think that we have like this awesome collection. And, and if we have time, definitely come up and take a look. Yeah. But so you can see how the pattern powder. repeats fairly well for this dad. Okay, before I move on, I'm going to make a quick mention the sleeves, other than the length. There's a difference between men's and women's. The men's are more closed in this region. While the women's are pretty much gaping open. So. Some of them are a little bit more questionable. We figure the one in his hand is probably a women's, Never. though he's it's worn debatable. it and we've decided it's good sex. <clears throat> because the, the sleeves on this one, I'm, the one I'm wearing, we know is a men's. And the sleeves on this one are actually fairly similar to the sleeves on this one. Yeah. So it's, it's questionable. Another debatable. thing about the sleeves. When it comes to women's and men's, men's are more square. Women's yeah. kind of have more curve. Uh, again, here's another men's. Very simple one, but as you can see on the sleeves, shorter. Shorter. And in this case, it's actually closed. It's not open like those other ones were. So, again, there are some differences you'll find here and there. Yay! Okay, so. Continuing along the casual kimono, this is a yukata. This is actually a picture from yukata kimono sakura. That's They're out of Japan. Kimono marka sakura. Yeah. Yes. And basically, the difference between kimono and yukata is this is festival wear. It's generally made out of cotton or uh, a rayon type material yeah. called, um, they call it jinkin. Jinkin. Uh, but most of the time, it's cotton. It's lightweight. It's meant to be worn during fireworks, anime festivals, kind of. So if you see a lot of this, this is why, because you're here at a festival. Uh, they're really, really colorful. Um, yeah. Any questions about kimono in general? <coughs> As you can see, also on Yukata, the, the patterns tend to be very busy. You're not going to yeah. see the simplified and everything. It's very alive. Um, it's festive. Festive. Yeah. They want to be fun. Cool. So I am also going to talk about the tourist and costume kimono, which at an anime con, I guess you can get away with. But if you want to wear proper ones, then I will tell you some of the differences. This one is made out of like polyester. It's probably shiny, and another way to tell a tourist kimono is it usually has a either a kojihimo of the same material or like an ogi based thing. This is a tourist kimono. It is actually a tourist kimono because it even has a tag that says made in Japan. Um, it's pretty, it's fun. I probably plan on wearing it later today. Um, this is not a official kimono. This one's Close to a yukata. Yeah. I mean, if you can, if you see the design and everything, I mean that's essentially what it is. But yeah, it did actually come with matching. Now it is a koshi kimono, so you could debate, you know, and say, oh, well, okay, it's yukata. No. And here's, here's a, uh, a koshi kimono to tie it on, because and then you use saying, an obi. And there's another difference, but, important difference. Yeah. That you'll see if you would uh, lift up one of the regular kimono, the actual authentic. Look at the back. There's something very important that is missing in this one. Can anybody tell me what it is? Anybody? 
Take a guess. Seam. Yes. Seam right down the back Seam of the middle. Seam in the middle. Japanese bolts are about this big. That is the width minus some hem line of the bolt used. It's not our American size, Standard. you know, kind of things where we're looking at the huge, but no, no, um, generally no. So that's kind of a way that you can figure out whether it's a tourist kimono or in some cases like uh, Talon, he makes Americanized kimono. He, he's, he likes to play with like kind of general kimono design and changes it however he sees fit. And actually the way he does his too, uh, for many of his his designs, he's able to work it out so it's uh, it's all cut from one piece of fabric. Um, like, that's it. All good and done right there. A um, couple stitches to kind of pull it together and there you go. Um, so yeah, you won't see the back seam or anything. Um, it, it's not a tourist one necessarily, but it is American made you know, kind of thing. And yeah, it's no problem. At midnight, he's like, oh, well, hell yeah. You're paying for his craft work. Yeah. <laughs> so, a uh, costume kimono, we've all seen it on eBay, and whenever Halloween comes along, you get your sexy geisha. Clearly, not kimono. Just because you have the kimono sleeves does not mean you're in kimono. Based on the original And these are usually made in brocade, which also makes me hurt, because yeah. brocade is from China. Or the heavy, like, that that obvious shiny polyester stuff, Ooh. et cetera, or rayon, et cetera. Um, but just that, that oh my God, that just bleeds bedroom. <laughs> I will give them credit for it's trying cute. to do something with the OB versus just a yeah. wrap around. And, and it's, it's cute. There's, there are times to wear it, but you know, it's reasons. one of the things that obviously, if you're going to a, an event where you would be wearing a formal kimono or yukata and you come wearing that. Yeah. Now at an anime convention, that could be part of your cosplay. And some of the cosplay designs, like um, if you look at Final Fantasy. Um, what? I always screw up which one it is. Uh, oh, um, you know. You know. Her outfit is based on kimono designs. Not a kimono, but it's, it's got very similar cut lines and everything to it. You can see where they pulled the design originally from. Um, and so you'll cosplay stuff out. That's not a problem. And that's why we do this panel, is to give you an idea of the base so that you know where to pull it in to do your costume, what to look for. If you're trying to actually do a, uh, a princess from, hand you know. Period. Yeah, hand you're period. Like or, 13 layers. Or a manga or an anime that actually has a princess character in it and you're trying to do a nice formal outfit, then now you know you look for a food soul day or even something we haven't brought out yet. No, we should talk about that now. Yeah, um, the other thing, which is okay. called an uchikake. It uh, is. There are two types. Yeah, let me talk. Go ahead. All right. Mm. So, basically there are two reasons you will ever wear an uchikake. Number one, you're royalty. Number two, you're getting married. Most Japanese don't buy these anymore. They rent them because you can get married. Um, and that's not the pretty side. Nope. So, here you go. And again, you can see nice long sleeves. Again, this would be worn by a single woman. Um, but, this is what you do you if do. you were like a royalty, if you were, you know, the, the emperor's wife, um, you might still have one with some length. It might not be quite as long, you might be down in here, but there'd still be some length to it. But you would still have this nice, heavy duty, you know, work up to it. Um, the thing that makes these obvious, so it has this big pillow here. If you see one of these, it is a nuchikake, it's not a kimono. You can still wear it, it's still great for wall decorations, but um, unless you get married, or cosplaying a bride, or cosplaying a princess, Try not to. They're expensive, so you probably don't want to bother yeah. the price. There's another thing. Um, we managed to store this for 400 bucks, which is like- Yeah, and I saw you go, no, that's cheap. No. <laughs> that's they have some wonderful looking ones, uh, you know, and they'll still point out the little flaws to it, and they're still like in the $1,000 range. Yeah, or more easily sometimes. over so, yeah. Um, now, Also, another reason you probably wouldn't want to wear it, this one is eight pounds. Okay, so she's going to 
demonstrate. I get the model. So this will be worn over top of the kimono. The kimono. And here's the fun part. You know, if you're really doing like the full on authentic, you would have layers. You'd have a couple of kimono layers, juban layers, and then this and on train. top of. Train. And it is made to train behind. Mm -hmm. Even when you're standing, it should actually have the train, mm -hmm. which is why the pillow's in there is to help protect it. Yeah. Um, and this was what got dragged in the Texas mud. And the male chauvinist, you know, fun part, I like to explain that's how they keep the house clean. But, yeah. <laughs> so, so. Um, and so this is see, actually generally worn more open. And I. There's two aspects to that. Open, but sometimes you'll see it done at close. But they still do, like, it'll still be positioned here ish when they do the closure. You know, not the tightness. So you still see a little bit of underneath. Okay. Uh, and there's a separate little deal for actually holding this. Um, but generally, open so that you can see everything. Yeah, you might have something that's similar to the Howdy tie yeah. without the pom-poms, but which I pretty much So That covers the, no. just the oh. Kimoto portion. The really quick explanation. This one is all white. They oh, have yeah. all white versions. They're specifically called Shiro Maku. Which means pure white. Yep. Uh, there's the other Uchikakes, which are a little bit more popular, either in red or gold, kind of a bleed off well, of... You'll see them in all sorts of different colors, but the red and gold... Are no, it's red and gold. No, it's red and gold. It's red and gold with some other colors, but the primary colors are red, gold, and white. Yeah. Because those are the lucky colors. A May not be China. Bleed over from China. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> those are the lucky colors. So. And you'll see cranes and, like, the embroidery work on these is amazing. Royalty carriages. Um, Uchikake um, are phoenixes, always is, which silk. I have. You will not see an Uchikake made out of anything other than silk. It's true. So this is the one that... It's heavy. You will sweat a lot. Yeah. It was very fun in mid-April in Fort Worth. Especially with a little bit of rain. It's sprinkled, which in apparently in Asia is a sign of the bug. Yay! Yay! Well, the pouring. So, types of Obi. What? It's a boot. Oh. Okay, so, very formal OB. Like the one that we showed you earlier. A really long one. This is pretty much only used in super, super formal events. Like your wedding, or your graduation, or your funeral, or somebody really close to you died. No, the width of it as well. They're really wide, they're really long. In addition to that, they are double sided completely, as you saw earlier. There's a design on both sides. Which distinguishes them from the next one, which is what I am wearing. This, on the left side, is called the Fukuro Obi. It is a little less wide. This is actually folded in half, to give you an idea, so it comes back here, folded in half. Um, it's actually that width in his hand, generally. Um, and it's not quite patterned on the whole side because there's actually a portion where it just wraps around your waist, so there's no point in decorating something that is just completely gonna hide. What evolved when people got tired of trying to wrap things, fold things continuously, trying to wrap it, he came up with this. Especially because when it folds, it doesn't always fold even. Sometimes you get one that slips a little, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And then they get the crease, and you never really get the crease out. It's so. very difficult to get fold lines out. <clears throat> That's what they refer to them as. So then, and more fold lines mean the value of your OB has just gone down. So then they told the manufacturers, hey, make it easier for us. So they did. They stitched it for them. Basically, it's the same thing, except the waist portion is already stitched. There are two types of Nagoya Obi. There's this and that, where there's a design here in the narrow portion, which usually falls around in this waist portion. And then there's this portion, which shows up in the knot in the back. No design. No design. Uh, there's design and on design. the other end. No, no, no. I know. I saw it. Okay. Design. Design. Anyway, cool. so these are also used in formal, but also semi-formal. So if you're going to tea ceremony, dance class, obviously the other 
formal events that I've mentioned a gazillion times. That's what you wear. Casual obi. Um, basically, they're called hanhaba. They're called hanhaba because it means half obi. It's like a half belt. They're half the width of a normal one. Um, they're used for casual instances. That's one example. Some of them are more stiff than others. That one actually is nice and flexible. It's really good for making... It's really comfy. Yeah, it is. Um, we actually invented a uh, goldfish uh, knot design a couple of days ago, which I may or may not show you tomorrow if you come to my movie knot time workshop. Notice the length difference? It is considerably shorter and not nearly as much fabric. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and show them the men's so I'm wearing a men's. There's two, well, there's a couple different variations. But this one, while well, generally men's, it's also uh, martial arts, etc. So you'll see this for uh, kendo, iaido, uh, the Aijutsu. obis, uh, yeah, uh, kenjutsu. any of those where they're wearing uh, the formal outfits, hakama and all. But it's a little easier to deal with. Now it's a little thicker. Um, so it's got some weight to it and some stiffness so it'll actually hold appropriately but obviously it's not as wide. <clears throat> then you have your nice little formal, especially this one. I mean look at the bold green on there, right? I so, thought it was really ugly at first and then I it grew on me. This one's actually a yeah, wide. Um, and even on the men's you'll find them like this and you'll fold it in half still about that width. Now the one I'm wearing starts out at it around that width. You can see right here. This is a very common style one. You'll see this in all sorts of colors about the same design pattern. Um, you see there's black background, white design, white uh, background, black design. You get the blue uh, with the white. I think I've seen uh, red. Uh, there's another blue that's a little brighter. Um, there's a bunch of colors. A so general green, Even I think. men have the options. Not a lot. Not a lot, but it's there. Ours are very simple. It's there, boom, done, no problem. They're more We're utility. Not, this and is about as flashy as you get on a men's, really. When it comes to <laughs> under or over Hakama, it kind of depends on preference. <clears throat> it depends on preference, how much of it you want to show. If you're going to wear it over, I strongly suggest that you have I didn't bring it with me, but there's there's actually a really, really small men's OB um, oh, yeah. that literally is probably about half of this width to begin with. Um, a little decorative, you know, look to it and all. I would wear something like that still. Put that on over the kimono, throw the hakama on, then put your nice fancy it one helps over. Keep the hakama up a little bit. Yeah, which I'll explain in a little while. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, so obviously this is another example of a kata in this picture. Um, we'll get to what this knot style is called in a minute. So, types of obi knots. The Japanese word for obi knots is musubi. So, if you hear musubi, that's what I'm referring to. Otaiko musubi. This one, for women, you can get away with any events that you ever attend, including a um, this is the one that I chose for my wedding. It's really, it does not matter what occasion is. This is just a go-to, believe not. This is a really nice diagram because it lets you kind of see the different kimono part, the different obi parts that I mentioned at the beginning of the panel. Um, this darker gray, this is the obi yage. The obi, ma yeah, the obi makura is hidden here. Can't really see it, but you kind of get a general idea. And for an otaiko, you have to have that. You have to have these. It's what this it sits right here, so it actually sits on over top and creates the drum. Gives it a yeah, little volume. Oh, that's right. Otaiko means drum. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, o actually is a, a formal you know, notation. So like technically, uh, sake should actually be called a osake if you want to get uh, what he's passing around is a really awesome thing from Ishiroya. They basically have the different uh, materials that get used in Japanese clothing a lot. So you can touch and feel and see. 
Um, this is the OPG bay here in the middle. I actually ended up using mine to help create this underfold or hold it tight against me. It's personal. This is another right. one where until you get the OBG made in place, you would actually hold temporarily with a Koshihimo. That temporary usage, like we mentioned earlier, that's where you would do it. Put it in there, then once you get it all situated, you run the uh, uh, core through and you're good. Oh, you? Yeah. yeah. That thing. That thing. Okay. So, Tsunodashi is this style, which is kind of. Um, it's a variation of this one. You probably don't need all the extra OB accessories, um, so that's kind of nice. Uh, this is done with a, like a hanhaba or a, what I like to call a yukata OB, so they're a more simple. And the difference between a, 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 like kind of more formal OB and the ones that you usually see with uh, yukata is the yukata ones are just one color on one side and a different. As you see there. Yeah. Um, I think this is kind of this is one of the young people's kind of ubi hunts. Um, so a little less formal than the otaiko. I think it's kind of a mix between the otaiko and the the bow. The bow. Yeah. So this is one I haven't experimented with, so I actually don't know how to tie this one. So maybe I'll get there eventually. The tataya. It's a gigantic bow. It's not just a bow, it's a bow. Oh. This is what you wear with the foot of so they <laughs> Yeah. This, this is says, a really fancy. This says, I'm a pretty princess, look at me. So, yay. I also have not tried this one out. I tend to stick with the small one. It's huge. It's huge. I think there's actually a specific OB not talked about, I think, that we Maybe. I don't know, your formal one is close to at least the length of Okay, so, Fugura uh, Suzume, it means the plump sparrow. So you get your cute little wings together. The fat body. It's, it's fat body. This is, once again, um, only for unmarried young women. Um, as you can see, it's being worn. I think you can wear it kind of in festival wear, but also in slightly more semi-formal settings. Um, you could probably get away with it, maybe a kind of informal tea ceremony as well. I've never experimented with this one because I didn't learn about kimono until I got right before I got married, so I suppose no we'll have to learn it so we can tie it on women. If nobody mentions it, I can get away with it because nobody will know the difference except for you guys. There we go. <laughs> so you see this a lot in geisha. It's the long draped ones. You might also see it in dancers. Uh, this doesn't really get used in everyday wear. It's essentially an otaiko that's not wrapped up all the way. Yeah, I think. Hey, it pretty actually, much just drapes straight no, down. No, there's actually two parts here. Two parts. Uh, yeah, okay. Since I've never, I don't. It's a pretty fancy one, and again, unless you're using it for specific or, or whatnot. Now, if you're going to cosplay along those lines, find somebody you didn't know, is, or you hit up in one of so you might have some instructions for it. Um, yeah. It's, and it's probably going to be something that you and somebody else needs to learn how to do, because they're going to have to help you. Yeah. Some of these knots you can do on your own, but plenty of them could actually use an extra pair of hands. Yeah. <laughs> There's a reason that um, Geisha had dressers to put clothing on them. Okay. Okay. Alright, good call. It's one of the um, bow styles. Basically, it ends up drooping. Um, yeah, Geisha <coughs> dancing and looking all pretty. So instead of having like the single drape, kind of like you saw previously, um, you've got like the two, it's almost like instead of doing a bow, you just let the, the two ends come out 
the side or something. It's like they, um, I guess, with the uh, Uchikake, you can also get away with it. Do the mating? Good, of course. Yeah. Thanks. Good job. I think, uh, I guess, you can also get away with it if you're a dancer, since all three of these are proper, formally trained geisha, so they can get away with it. Yeah. And you see how open, uh, on the left side, how open that is worn. Uh, again, that's wearing something like an Uchikake. Uh, and in this case, they have the uchikake on, and then they are putting the obi over top. Now, actually, what you'll see is they'll have a juban. They're going to have a kimono under that's going to have a, um, an obi on as well. Then they have the uchikake on, and then the big, huge obi that they're working with on top of that. So a lot of layers. They might not. She does. Yeah. She does. Anyway, so butterfly musubi. You'll see this a lot in. Um, this is actually probably what's called a pre-tied obi. You basically, you wrap the waist portion around, and then this part is already done for you. It just has this, this tag, you stick it in the top of the obi, you're done. Now, some of the pre-tieds cost about as much as a regular obi. Actually, sometimes uh, I find they cost more. Yeah, it depends on, uh, and they can be, most of the time they're done very, very well. I've seen a few where, you know, I, I've been able to look and just noticed, oh, it's a pre-tie. What you're going to see on pre-ties a lot of times is, um, like, especially with a lot of the dance groups and, and things, uh, sometimes the, the little old ladies, like uh, Ikikon, if anybody was there, they had, like, a, a group of little ladies uh, doing some dance. And I think almost all of them have pre-ties. Uh, it's easy to get into, but the easy way to notice is all of their obis look the same. Generally, obis are unique. Except for men's, ours are pretty much all the same. Very Hanhaba sometimes yeah. tend to be fairly similar. But when it comes into the, the decent OBs and everything, they're unique somehow or another. Uh, so if they all look the same, it's probably a pre tie. You might find similar colors and patterns, but it would be yeah. not the same. Yeah. And pre ties are usually done in this. Um, the other common one you'll see for pre ties is the Otaiko from earlier. So we're gonna get into men's stuff, so I'll let him take over on that. Okay, and men's not. So uh, this one's called a clam's mouth. Kind of good. Um, I kind of get why it's called it, but that's about it. Uh, men's knots tend to lay very flat um, because we don't like having a big ass knot in our back. So what you're looking at is it lays flat a lot of times, and if you're a woman actually wearing hakama, because they do have hakama for women as well, then you're gonna wanna wear one of these styles um, for the men. There's a clam's mouth, there's also another one which I'm wearing. Um, that it's because they lay flat that it, it helps and you'll want it for wearing with the hockey one. So as I quickly drop around. Um, get undressed for us. This is the yeah. So we'll demonstrate now Pokemon when they go on are actually done up the, there's a front tie and then there's a back tie. You do the front first. It also makes it a lot easier when you have to go to the bathroom. You take this little part and proper hakama usually have a, a kind of board stiffener or something in here that keeps this portion here. Um, some manufacturer ones, American made, etc., they don't bother putting that. Another thing is this little tab here. What they make this out of is questionable. This one's plastic, you'll see it a lot. But this little tab goes in up and like that with your obi knot back behind it. Helps keep this here. Okay. So this is why you want this flat. You want to be able to get that all held up and in there. And you don't want a whole lot of bulk. It's like a weird bulge in the middle of your back. Bring up here. This comes up again. And then you tie. Japanese like things to lay flat. Yes. Now generally, like, when you're doing the front ties, the front ties sometimes are long. So there's a special way of doing it. So you keep everything nice and flat and, and neat. When you do the front, or uh, when you're tying this back set, the last set, these? For men, I generally suggest you come in under the obi. Your obi is going to sit. When using hanhaba men's obi styles, when doing it for martial arts purposes, the top of your obi is at the top of your belly button. That's where it should be placed. And then the top of the hakama play right over that. So right in like that. And when you tie this last one, come in under the obi, and it helps it keep it all nice and snug and in place. You don't get shifting around and everything. You'll notice if otherwise you'll get the shifting. Um, and if you're a larger guy, 
having it done this way also helps a lot um, because of that shifting. So just a nice little square knot, and then you just do a nice little tucking of the tie under the rest of it. So it's out of the way. And it stays in there pretty well. Now, if you don't have, yeah, if you don't have your obi knot tied tight enough, it will work itself loose. The clam's mouth is kind of bad about doing that. Um, the fabric in your obi will make a difference. Um, this green one, the green design is done in such a way that it's very slick and it likes to slip out on itself. Uh, the one I'm wearing, uh, the Han Haba here, no slippage whatsoever. I've never had a problem with them. They hold fairly well because the friction on the fabric actually keeps it there. This is the Lonely Samurai. Uh, lonely Man's basically kind of form. Um, because you don't have any help. Yeah. And, and it's, it's easy. It's fairly easy the way it goes in. Uh, it ties. And again, it's kind of held by friction. I mean, there's a little looping up in here and then one here. So it kind of holds itself in place. But it also lays very flat, so that makes it fairly handy too. Probably also useful whenever you have your, your sword that's digging in your pit. Costume. Yeah. Um, when you tie a obi by yourself, generally, tie it in the front, then you do the turn. Uh, usually when you do the turn, because you're doing left, left over right, left, a great way to remember it, left over right, you take it and turn to your right so that it doesn't pull it open. That kind of thing. A little handiness there. Okay. Okay, so this is the Ichimonji. That's the one I'm actually doing right now. And that's a variant. Which I haven't quite learned. Yeah. It's the we're, we're still figuring figure that out. out. But it should be so, it should be something similar, but we haven't quite worked it out. Uh, but it basically looks kinda like a Swiss cross. Even. Obviously. Oh, go back to that one. What? Go back. Okay. I'll care for it over time. Anyways. Um, <laughs> so, <clears throat> on this one, we found there's a couple different things in doing it. You can kind of see right here, um, they still have uh, the OB kind of there, but it looks like it was lifted a little bit. Generally, when you do this wrapping, you'll go under the whole thing uh, and, and wrap. But if you only go under the first little part, which this one was done up that way, they kept it kind of loose and did it in such a way, so it holds, it's not a problem. But you can do it nice and tight, and like for women, you can create just a tiny little bow kind of thing. It's a little more feminine like if you want to. But it comes out a little bulkier if you're rounding this over more. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So, when it comes to OB, you should be pretty much the sky's limit. There's Play some fancies. Play with it. Um, yeah. I haven't quite gotten to that point. I can do like this cute little fan that I'll teach you guys to have. But kind of, um, you eventually get comfortable, you try different ones and you get comfortable with it and then you're more willing to try other ones that are basically, they took that and made it a variety. This very quickly turned into a fan type one. It's kind of all along the same general principles. Yeah. It's, yeah, that's it. So, um, immortalgeisha.com. Go to them. <coughs> to everything you ever wanted to know. I'm still learning about it. Um, if you want to go to our website, uh, actually find us on Facebook. We call it the Brass Apple. I'm more than happy to tell you any information that I know. We have our website in development, but. Facebook for now. Yes. Um, the Matsuri is starting, so if you guys want to run off to that, feel free um, to the festival, etc. Uh, but if you'd also like to take a look, get a little hands-on with some of the stuff, feel free. And uh, we have plenty of time, and it's not being used for a while. So if anybody actually wants to get dressed up, we're more than welcome to show you. Yay. And you can experience the heaviness. <laughs> I come tomorrow at six o'clock. Yes. Uh, in the evening to come figure out how to tie this beautiful knot here. Hopefully and other ones. With the men, I will actually be showing you how to tie so if anybody's interested. there are things for men too. Yep. See you guys tomorrow. Okay. And. Uh,